today I wanted to jump into a little bit of building movement um, and identifying if there's actually going to be movement. Um, the reason I wanted to do this is because I think a majority of our projects now, um, the managers are sending building movement RFI before they give it to us to work on. So I just want to do a refresher to all of us who may not be sending building movement RFIs um, anymore because the managers have kind of taken over that responsibility. Um, so this is going to be a detail that we're going to look at. This is a section cut from a project I'm working on. And the question is, is there going to be building movement? So this is going to be an interactive lessons learned. So I'm looking for people to give an idea based on what you see right now. Is there going to be building movement? Yes, no, why? It will be limited to L over 600 if I wouldn't have any other information. Masonry okay. code, yeah, the masonry code uh, typically limits those types of facades and any masonries to the flag no more than L over 600. Okay, so the best thing to do is identify what we have. And Javier kind of pointed out, this is a brick facade. It has limitation on uh, deflection that Javier mentioned, but we also see that we have a steel beam here. Okay, then we have the roof system. So this is at, at a roof. So let, let, let's dive a little bit more in, in depth and look at the details that we see here on A721. So we'll first look at the top one. This gives some more detail. Okay, there's the brick veneer that we see. Okay, there's that same steel beam. Okay, the 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 wall that is supporting everything, that's cold form steel. We can see that here, six inch metal stud, 16 inches on center. Oh, there's a deflection track. Sam, is there gonna be building movement? We're showing a deflection track. Uh, no, but that is the no? point of the deflection track. So take them okay, over that's right. the point of the deflection track. Okay, let's look at the bottom detail. Okay, there's that brick again. Okay, the brick is supported by a steel lintel. Then we see a little little treated block wood, and then we see the cold form steel stud and the box hair and everything. Okay, so maybe maybe that's supporting everything. Okay, but based on this, is there gonna be building movement? And the question when I look at this detail is, is it typical to hang a lintel off of a cold form steel metal stud? I mean, it, could be done, but it probably shouldn't be done. Okay, but there's a deflection track. If I add weight to that, what's the purpose of the deflection track? Is it actually working? Because we're going to, if the lintel was supported by the studs, what's the purpose of the deflection track? It's kind of pointless. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. All right, let's look at the structural plans. Everything up to this point has just been architectural. So let's look at the structural plan. Oh, okay. Well, now we see that this lintel is actually supported by this C channel. And there's a continuous plate that runs along the whole entire length of the, the opening. Okay, well, that gives us a little bit more information. But as Javier pointed out recently, the, the brick has an allowable deflection limit of L over 600. Now, to this point, you have no idea what the elevation looks like. So maybe it's a good time to see the elevation length, you know, the width. That way we can get an idea of what that L over 600 value is. Well, the, the curtain wall is 15.5 foot wide, which gives you a deflection limit of about 0.3 inches from the brick. Okay. That's pretty easy to handle. That's not massive. But then the question I kind of always think about is, does the order of installation matter? I mean, if, if we're saying that the brick is going to move 0.3 inches due to its dead weight, does it matter if the brick is installed before the curtain wall? Or does it, I mean, can the curtain wall be installed before or after the brick? Does that matter? So it's the installation is after the brick. But in this case, it's not brick above that, that head, though. It's this corrugated metal. Correct. But, all right, you pointed out the obvious here, but let's just say it was the brick. Yeah. Well, it really doesn't matter. And the reason it doesn't matter is because the lintel, like I said, is supported by 
the C channel. The C channel is rigidly attached to the beam. So the beam's gonna move with any roof loads that we have. So everything here that you see is gonna be moving together as one unit. So the building movement is not coming from the brick itself, it's coming from the beam. And in this case, the beam was moving about three quarters of an inch is what the engineer worker identified for my project. And the cold form steel that we previously saw, it's actually supported onto this continuous quarter inch plate. And then the deflection track is just making sure that it's not being crushed in between these C channels that are at four foot on center. So take time when you start doing building movement RFIs to dive in and, and look at all this to make sure, all right, do I need to send an RFI for this area to see just what is actually going on? Because ultimately, if we can send less in an RFI, we can get RFIs back faster. If we send a very general RFI and the structural engineer has to go through this step, it might take a couple days or weeks to get an RFI response back because they have to go through every single detail like I just did. Does anybody have any questions, comments, anything like that? So when you say that the deflection of the beam is three quarters of an inch, does that violate the bricks all over 600 design? Does it? Well, is the entire span of that beam, I'm assuming it's greater than just the 15 feet. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. So, because then that becomes the question of if you have a section of wall where the brick or masonry is supported by steel framing, can you still then assume that it's going to be following the L over 600 because brick is involved? So that's a good question. But we have to remember that this whole entire unit that you see here moves as one. So if this goes down three quarters of an inch, the C channel that's supporting the lintel is going to go down three quarters of an inch and it's going to bring the brick with it. So really, we're not seeing the three quarters of an inch at the brick level. It's not, the brick level is really for the lintel deflection. Is the right. lintel deflection going to exceed the, the brick limitations? Um, and that's a completely different design that we don't really have to ever worry about. That's somebody else's you know, design. But just to answer your question again, this whole entire unit's moving as one. And there's right. most likely, there's going to be a joint where in the brick where there's a joint in the curtain. So that whole entire unit is going to be moving as one. I'm, I'm going to respond to that question too a little bit, uh, Ben. That, um, uh, typically where you see any brick or masonry supported from a structural detail aspect, the engineer, the structural engineer of record has really done a good job of limiting that beam deflection to L over 600. Whatever the span of the beam is, it may not be the, the opening, but it's the span of the beam that you can be assured that if you run a calculation, a simple calculation of that span of the beam divided by 600, that that's probably exactly the, the, uh, the limit for the deflection. Okay. So I guess a follow-up question for young engineers that may not have experienced this yet. Can you anchor into that steel lintel? Yeah, that was the question I was going to ask next, right? We never, in cases like this, since the lintel is only supporting the, the brick, we can't just assume that we can anchor to that, right? Because we don't know if it was designed to take the load. We have to strike back to that stud frame that we saw. Yep, that's right. Most of the time, lintels are just designed for dead load of the masonry. It's not designed for us to dump load into it. Can you go back to that detail in the architecturals? So in this one, like Kyle showed, you know, that lintel is actually attached to structure. Um, so it's a little bit better. Let's say this is a shorter storefront system, maybe six, eight foot, and it shows this detail and the structural drawings don't have any of that other stuff that Kyle was showing with C channels, you know, attaching back into the I-beam. So watch out for these. Um, these are uh, like what Kyle and, you know, Sam were just talking about. These are, these are what they call loose lintels. 
in a lot of cases if if there's no actual structure that the lintel is attaching to and we have box headers behind um these are these are kind of a big deal a good place to look for whether or not your lintel is a loose lintel or attached for structure is uh they usually will have in the structural drawings a loose lintel schedule um so that's something that i always dive into to make sure um because like kyle was mentioning these lentils a lot of cases when they're loose lentils over certain spans they will span out and they'll actually rest on the brick on either side of our window window and they'll support all the brick up above our window just for gravity load so if we let our client attach into it and it's not designed or strapped back into anything for lateral load it could just yank that lintel out. It's not really a side note, but it's somewhat related to anchoring to lintels. I've uh, I've seen a few specifications and actually a few requirements per, per like uh, the state's codes. I think it was the state of Washington that they uh, they specifically say for every delegated design set of drawings for for non-structural components. The loads that are transferred to the structure should be clearly shown uh, on the on the drawings. I know we we rarely do that. We we try to uh, and and our our clients, you know, even if we start showing those loads, which will take a lot of extra time, but it, our clients will probably ne never even include them on the on the final set of Shaw drawings. Has that uh, has that ever been a request for a specific project uh I, I don't think in the couple of ones that i've done in washington that uh, that we received a uh, you know a, a resubmit request showing those those reaction loads uh but i don't know Stuart, from your experience would you say that uh, that some states are more picky about that about showing the loads that the curtain walls are transferred into the into the main main structure like to lintels or brick yeah, no, I, I think that that's a good point that, you know, all the time as a, a structural, a specialty structural engineer, we need to be making sure that there's a good load path. But, you know, answering your question, there really isn't, I, I haven't found that there is a pickiness amongst states or, you know, mostly it's client preference mm. or shop drawing provider preference. Mm. And what they have a habit and a routine of doing uh, that kind of governs whether or not there's going to be uh, loads involved in you know all of the uh, all of the anchor locations. I think they're, they're they're a detailing provider out in the East Coast, and and all the time on their drawings, usually they'll have some type of a requirement for indicating loads mm. uh, associated with elevations. As a follow up. To Gorney, I guess. Can we anchor into that two by blocking that's right there? Is that blocking designed for it? Is that being installed? Um, in a case like this, I'd probably double check and make sure that we can do that. So in this case, I would not. I would not give you a hundred percent yes or no um, either way that we can or cannot install in that. Um, we'd have to do a little bit more digging. Either that or, you know, we, uh, well, number one, I think that that's a correct, that's an absolutely correct response. And what you've done, Kyle, is that you've gone further into the structural drawings. So that's, that's your first thing to do. But then if I, if I saw something like this, you know, I, I may uh, design a wood connection possibly, and then call that out in the details, the shop drawings and say that this this is structural wood blocking required uh, by some other somebody else not yeah. by uh, the glazing contractor or JEI I'm uh, go ahead and leave that up there Kyle oh. I wanted to I'm just I was waiting for just a second and then I was going to hop in yeah so um, I I just wanted to make a couple different comments I'm going to request control one of the issues also with you know, anchoring through lentils is very, you know, all the time they have this moisture barrier and flashing. And the moisture barrier usually is below the flashing and it kind of couples that area. And the flashing is usually right above that. And so if there is a possibility of anchoring and we go through that, 
what do we do to the system and its water prevention? We're actually opening up a, a drain hole inside of the building area. And we could get water coming inside of the building. So definitely something to be aware of. One of the other items that I noticed with this, and I thought it was an excellent, uh, you know, Kyle, you did an excellent job of digging further because in something like this, there's an, there's actually an error that has happened in the contract drawings. The architect has shown one way of supporting, whereas the structural engineer has showed a completely different way and they're not consistent with each other. In what the architect has shown here, they show a box beam header that's independent of structural movement. And what the structural engineer has shown, very nice. So what he has shown is an independent structure with a header that is designed for the span of the opening and it has a metal track up there so that it's not affected by structural building movement, whereas the structural engineer over there has completely disregarded what the architect has indicated, and he's gone for something that does involve a complete structure, and it has structural building movement associated with it. So this is an inconsistency that you find very often in between architectural drawings and the structural drawings. And potentially, there is a, there's a possible avenue for a claim by our client back to uh, the GC and upward because of that. Because now, they have to deal with structural movement and it may require a, a header that is a, a, a receptor instead of what mitigated structural movement and could have been designed direct. In this case, our client has a potential claim against the contract for misleading him. So Stuart, in cases like this, uh, you're implying that we should follow the structural and assume that there will be movement instead of following the architectural uh, drawing. Yes. Yeah. Kyle has done an excellent job of digging a little bit deeper to see the actual structural engineer and what he did. So, Stuart, a question for you. To me, it makes sense what is shown in the structurals because, I mean, I don't think that bolting a loose lintel, you know, through the treated blocking into the into the C channels is something that is probably done all that often. They're probably doing that with a weld, I would assume. So I guess going back to my question of can we anchor to the wood blocking, this brings up will the wood blocking actually be there? Yeah. Yeah. That, that that's a question that I would ask. There. Yeah. You've you found a different detail and it doesn't have the wood blocking at all. So our client may be back on this detail. Whereas he hasn't picked up this, there's no wood blocking in there. They can't even shove wood blocking in there. In this case, they really have to have some wood blocking down here, and we would have to have a strap going back into that wood blocking. And we'd have to have a receptor. <laughs> I find this very often, it's a, it's a horrible inconsistency in between what the architect has planned for and what the structural engineer has done. Yeah, it happens far too often. Go on. No, that's it, go ahead. Is there any way our clients can see this earlier or we can see it early enough to help, you know, sooner? Well, I think that this is one of the ways you can get a video out there and we can discuss this with clients. But ultimately what clients are typically doing, they're not going to the structural drawings. They're not going through that process. They go into the architectural drawings and they formulate a bid. 
and that's their bid. It's based upon what's in the architectural drawings. They won't dig very deep into the structural drawings at all, if they ever do. The, the secondary issue on that is the detailers who are providing the shop drawings to our clients, they're also not going into the structural drawings. They're, they're getting details directly from architecturals and reproducing them, which is what I'm finding. And when I started doing the digging, okay, now we have potential issues of this not being drafted correctly, not necessarily at the fault of the drafter, but of the inconsistencies in the drawing between yeah. the structurals and architecturals. So if we did, if we were involved in some kind of pre-engineering capacity, would we be able to spot this early on? Yes, I believe so. And I think that's, I think we'd have to that's, be, but, but see, that's, that's the, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, oh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, sorry. I, it's tough because, like, with pre-engineering, typically, you know, it this would be hard to catch, I feel like, still, because uh, when I'm doing pre-engineering, it's usually looking at the verticals and seeing how, you know, if the system will work right. It, it would almost have to be asked for or by the client, or we'd be, you know, doing doing a full calc package before an architectural review, which is which is atypical. So I, this is just, I think these are just unfortunate circumstances where delegated design just has some cracks. I don't know if this is something that, you know, it's just like you, like Stuart said, the best way to do it is just to warn clients. And ultimately, I, what I struggle with some of these, the, as the older I get in this industry, is that the structural engineer, on, in this case, is clearly expecting the window system below it to accommodate for deflection, but doesn't include it in his general notes, what that deflection is, and like clearly lay it out. Because I have seen some structural engineers that do that, so I, I feel it's a it's just a gap in some some structural engineers' processes processes or whatever when it comes to delegated design. Well, here's here's the problem, Gorney. The structural engineer of record thinks that they have. They think that it's pretty clear that L over 360 for live load movement of floors and L over 240 for live load movement limitations for rubs covers their basis. They don't understand that there is a gap between what the systems can tolerate in terms of building live load movement and what their what the limitations are in the building code. There's a gap between there. They don't understand that. So yeah, maybe maybe that uh, information that you're saying the video would be better directed at structural engineering firms. Um, I know a job that I'm on with Ben. I was on with the structural engineer and. You know, he was an older guy, and he even said what, what you're saying, Stuart. He said, well, I plugged in L over 360 into the program and told it to size my beams. Yeah. Um, and then, they, you know, they clearly show that it accommodates for deflection. And I explained, well, you're asking for huge, huge sealant joints. And, you know, then the structural engineer was kind of interested. He's like, well, what, what's a good limit? What should I start limiting this to in the future? I think Kyle had one like that, too, where the engineer was asking questions. Um, so, yeah, there's just a weird gap in our industry that we're trying to fill. I had that happen last week. I talked to a structural engineer on a separate project. It was a smaller project, and I, he was asking about the building movement, why we were asking, and I explained it to him. He goes, well, I didn't know that there was going to be such a big issue. And it's a smaller structural firm down in Louisiana. I said, yeah, if you can limit movement above any glazing system to a half inch do it because that's so easy for us with the program we use we just click a beam tell the limitation of deflection and be done because it's so easy for me to do just nobody's ever told me and then we got into how curtain walls and storefronts are anchored he had no idea that curtain walls had a point load where the verticals terminate at the head and sill. So he goes, that, that could affect some of my past designs I've done. I mean, that could be dumping a lot of load as a in a point load capacity into something that I didn't necessarily design it for. I didn't know that's how that's done. 
Hey, Kyle, and that was one of the reasonings behind my question to Stuart about us clearly showing the load transfer and the magnitude of the loads into the supporting structure. Um, I would say eight out of ten engineers out there, they're not, they're not in the glazing industry. They assume that the loads from glazing is a distributed line load around the opening, and they design their opening that way. It's never like that. <laughs> you know, it's always a high concentrated point load, very localized. And you're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of point loads on, on, on structures that J.I. And, and all the glazing engineers were kind of crossing our fingers that it was designed for that. <laughs> but but yeah, so so it would it, it's it's uh, because this this industry is something that you learn from on the job and you're not really formally, you know, trained in school on how to try and like glazing systems work and it's so new. Very few engineers out there understand the, how the loads are transferred from curtain walls and storefronts to supporting structures. So, you know, that that's, I guess that that's one of the reasons why some states require the sub sub delegated designs of you know the the traits such as glazing to clearly show the loads and the structure. Um, but that would be you know kind of an undertaking to add every single load on, on the shop drawings. And, and and see whenever you take that a step further, Javier, you know that's a burden that uh, most of our clients can't support cost-wise, you know, because it adds extra time and effort associated with all of that information that we need to have compensation for getting into the drawings. So, I mean, would an and, option and, be, and, in Javier's case, to add a note that says reference calculations, sheet, yeah. da da da, or loads? Well, ultimately, we are fulfilling that obligation. We're showing in our connection calculations the way that we're anchoring in and loads. And so who's supposed to be reviewing that? The structural engineer of record. And so we're, we're actually performing that obligation, but it's in a calculation submittal. It's not necessarily in a shop drawing submittal. And again, the burden of understanding how loads are transmitted by various components and cladding into their structure is the structural engineers of records burden. It's their responsibility to be able to understand the limitations and how things are anchored onto the structure. It's not our burden, you know, to... to uh, show them and educate them. That's not our burden. Although we want to help out in the industry and so that's why we do educational, you know, seminars for structural engineers so that they can understand, you know, what are the limitations associated with glazing system design. Hey Stuart, another another thing when you're referring to that burden, um I just want want people to be aware that when, when we're discussing about going di diving into the architecturals and structurals, looking for these slip tracks and these different conditions, um, we we do need to be aware of that. But at the same time, do not do not spend an enormous amount of time doing this. Um, if we have a larger project, we can eat through so many hours trying to figure out information that the EOR should be able to provide us. Um, so, so again, yeah, there are times where we want to go through some specific details and, and, and try to help our clients out, but we really need to watch that and not get sucked into a black hole um of okay we bring this up to the client well then we start talking about all the details and the architecturals and structurals and then we again burn through all of our hours um so it's a it's a balancing act there good point uh, to pick it back on what, uh, to pick it back with what Oliver said then 
my question is, what would be the proper procedure? Because from this conversation, my assumption was now, every time I see this detail, I need to make sure that, you know, this is what it's actually showing and that it's not a case like this where there's a discrepancy. If that's not what we're supposed to do, because it will take you know, too much time, should we just assume then generally that what they have shown in the shop drawings is okay? Or is there a specific case where we say, let me double check this, um, how we, should we proceed? I mean, I think that uh, storefront head conditions like this, I'm not double checking architecturals all the time. Those are pretty straightforward conditions. Um, if there, I, I may go and check um, just section cuts just to look, do a quick check um, on some of these conditions. Um, it's that's really a, <laughs> a t tough question to answer because, I mean, it can vary project to project on what things we're seeing in the shops. And because of that, yeah, we may want to go go look at and double check things. But at the same time, we can't go through and make sure every little thing shown is in alignment with the architecturals. Um, it 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 just it would take too much time um Stuart, i don't know if you have a better explanation on that so uh, i think what, one just, thing that i yeah. might add to uh and it might not be uh, <laughs> for the liking of the newer engineers but this is something that also kind of comes with just experience after seeing hundreds and hundreds of architectural drawings Stuart probably has you know 20 times experience that Quinlevin has and Quinlevin has maybe like 10 times experience that Gordon, uh, Ryan and I do because we've just been exposed to such a, you know, high volume of architecturals that it's, it's hard to put like give you, oh yeah, this is a red flag and this is a red flag because there's so much in between too. And, and yeah, kind of like, unfortunately, it's just some, sometimes it just comes down to experience of having seen this drawings and, and, and seeing things like, oh, yeah, I, I might take want to take a closer look at this and that. And, and it's, it's unfortunately, it sometimes it takes, you know, burning your hand a couple of times to really know, OK, no, I really need to look into this and this other. And that's why the team leads are here to, to catch these things before they get out, uh, to, you know out of uh, JEI. The, the other thing that we've started doing on, on our sealed shops, the note that we're slapping on there is essentially all of the surrounding structure um, that's there is, Stuart, I, for, I forget the, the wording of that stamp, um, but it's basically saying that we're not responsible for that surrounding structure yeah. we're essentially dealing with a, a curtain wall storefront connection to us to steel to it's, wood it's uh, something that is capable of supporting the uh the loads so, right. so, so the exact in other, words, in other words it's not our responsibility for uh their structure being able to support Right. you know, the loads that are imposed by the glazing system. So, um, you know, to answer your question just a little bit more, Sam, and provide some advice, you know, many times as a, you know, if I'm setting up a project, what I'll do real quick is I'll, I'll flash through all of the details of the structural drawings. I'll just look at the details. I'll start running through the details real fast, and I'll look at it, and I'll say, uh, wait a minute. I might catch on to a detail like this and go, just a second there. That doesn't look like our shop drawings. There's something that's different. And so that usually is an easy way of, at the very beginning, of isolating some of these issues and then also potentially peeling off some of these details and putting them in an RFI and saying, hey, structural engineer record, what is the movement associated with uh, these at openings? What is the, what is our, uh, what does our uh, system have to, have to uh, handle in terms of building structural movement? 
So, uh, you know, hopefully that's a lot of that has been done in some circumstances. It may not have been done and you may, you know, find something like this. But it, the easy way to catch something like this is to flash through the structural details. And those will usually, you know, either they look like something that's in the shop drawings or they don't. And to, to kind of add on to that, if you do see something like this and it doesn't have an RFI answer to it, just ask one of us, like me or Matt or Point Eleven, because it, it may be something that does need to be RFI and we may have missed it or the RFI just hasn't been done. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, was this the humble ISD? Yes. Sticks? Okay. So I ended up doing the whole RFI for this, and this is one of those conditions where yeah it's kind of hard to follow and even when i asked the eor like for movement he went down a rabbit hole of like how detailed do you need it do we need to have the trusses included and all the interaction from the c channel and stuff and i just had to break it down so oh, no just the beam so those are kind of some of the things you need to think about too when you're bringing up these questions is how to simplify it for yourself and everybody else save everybody time well kyle uh very nice job associated with us i think i think this was a really good uh discussion point and uh, very educational too